So where we left off on Friday is Sir Gowan finally gets his hit, or let me rephrase that. Sir Gowan finally receives his hit. Uh, bottom of page 285, fit four. The knight nicks him on the third stroke. If you remember the first stroke, Sir Gowan flinches, and so the knight doesn't follow through. The second stroke, the knight faints to see if Sir Gowan is actually going to not flinch, and Sir Gowan gets a little upset about that. And then the third stroke, he actually hits him a little spurt of blood on the snow. Sir Gowan jumps away very quickly. We're told, line 23, 16, more than a spear's length. That would be minimum seven or eight feet. Okay, so that's a pretty good just standing broad jump. Um, grabs his helmet, crams it on his head, you know, grabs his sword, and says, hold your attack, sir, don't try it again, 23-22. I've passively taken a blow in this place, and if you offer me another, I shall repay it promptly, return it at once, be certain of that with force. One single blow will do, that con the contract is my proof, witnessed in Arthur's Hall, and therefore, sir, enough. In other words... When we started your little game a year ago, you took a blow from me. The agreement was I would then take a blow from you. We've done it. We've both met our sides of the bargain. Deal is done. Then the knight just stands where he is and rests on his axe, sets the shaft on the ground, and leans on the blade. Now, we're told what about the green knight? He's really big. Okay, I'm 5'10". If I were to lean on the blade of the axe, that would mean the blade would be probably, the axe blade and handle would be five feet. Kind of imagine the knight's good six and a half, seven feet tall. That means his axe handle and blade are at least six feet tall. So this is a big stinking axe in it. Okay? And... He says, 2338, Brave sir, don't act so wrathfully in this place. Okay. Don't be so full of wrath and anger in this place. What is this place? It's the Green Chapel, right? A chapel is a place of anger? No. A chapel is a place of love, supposedly. No one has discourteously mistreated you here. That is, no one has violated the laws of courtesy, the laws of gentlemanliness, the laws of chivalry. You've been treated fairly or acted contrary to the covenant sworn at the king's court, okay, at Camelot. I promised you a blow and you have it. Think yourself well paid. I free you from the rest of all other obligations. Now what could Sir Gowan interrupt with right here? What other obligations? I have no other obligations to you. My only obligation was to meet you New Year's Day. Had I been more dexterous, you know, what does dexterous mean? Good with your hands, right? Ambidextrous means you can write with, use both hands, right? So had I been more dexterous, maybe I could have dealt you a more spiteful blow to have roused your anger. That is, maybe I could have dealt you a blow that would justify your anger. He's saying, you have no right to be angry here. First, I threaten you playfully with a pretense and avoided giving you a gash, doing so rightly because of the agreement we made on the first night. What should Sir Gowan be thinking at this point? What? What do you mean? What agreement? What first night? When you faithfully and truly kept your pledged word. 
the knight has just linked all three motifs or elements of the poem. He's just linked the beheading game with the exchange of winning and the temptations. Gave me all your winnings as an honest man should. So, first night, you proved yourself totally honest to me. The, that other feint, I gave you for the next day. When you kissed my lovely wife, there, now it's made clear, I am the knight of the castle. And gave me those kisses. For both occasions, I aimed at you two mere mock blows without harm. Why without harm? Because he was honest. And those kisses were harmless. Right? There is nothing nefarious, there is nothing evil, there is nothing adulterous with those kisses. For both occasions, I aimed at you two mere mock blows without harm. True man must pay back truly. Then he need nothing fear. What's he, sell, what's he saying before he gets to the third blow? If you were a true man, true, honest, faithful, loyal, virtuous, gentil, G G E N T I L, right? Which we're going to talk about in just a moment with Chaucer. He says, Then you what? You had nothing to fear for this day. And yet, what did Sir Gowan do? He took the sash because he feared. What, how did the knight introduce the challenge back on Christmas Day? <coughs> in Camelot. A game. He begged a game. He challenged them. Oh, yeah. He said, Come on, are you guys the knights of the round table or not? You're supposed to be the mightiest, most fierce. I mean, you won't even accept the challenge to a game? <coughs> Go back even further. What are we told must happen before Arthur will eat? Okay, everybody else has got to have has got to be served. Good host, by the way. I mean that is still in, in quote unquote, you know, Ms. Manners' book of manners, Letitia Ball, Letitia Ball Drake, I think, has written a book on manners and etiquette. Um, that's still one of the rules. Usually, it's the hostess, right? What else? On a feast day like this, like Christmas, he wants to hear a marvelous tale or see some marvelous thing. And he didn't raise the green knight. You got your wish, Arthur. And what's he want? To play game. It's Christmas. It's a time of revelry and revel making. It doesn't mean lop off my hand and kill me. There's a reason why that happens, why, you know, Sir Gowan lops his head off. And it's because Arthur's pissed. Because the Green Knight did what? He challenged Arthur's manhood, essentially. He challenged the reputation of his court. So here, true man must pay back truly. Then he need nothing fear. You failed me the third time and took that blow, therefore. How did he fail the third time? He didn't take off the sash and say, I got this. Why not? What are we going to be told very shortly? What did he fear for? His life. His life. For it is my belt you are wearing, the same woven girdle. My own wife gave it to you. I know well in truth. I know all about your kisses and your courteous manners and my wife's wooing of you. I arranged it myself. 
In other words, Sir Gowan, I was the one tempted you. We're going to find out in a moment, however, there's someone behind the knight. So the knight's behind the wife, and there's someone behind the knight putting him up to a kite. I sent her to test you. And to me, truly, you seem one of the most perfect men who walk on the earth. Notice he doesn't say, and to me, you truly seem the most perfect man who walked on the earth. Okay. His pearls are more valuable than the white peas, so is Gawain in all truth before other fair knights. Only here you fell short a little, sir, and lack. Fidelity, faithfulness. But that was not for fine craftsmanship. That is, you didn't take it because of its beautiful woven texture. Just like he didn't take the ring she offered because of its beautiful, wealthy gold. He says, no. Nor for wooing either, nor did you take it for the love of my wife. But because you wanted to live. So I blame you the less. Who wouldn't want to live, right? That other brave man stood, you know, he's just standing there and his jaws dropped to the ground. He's still trying to wrap his, I think, trying to wrap his head around the comment about the first night. It's almost like he hasn't heard about the other two. So mortified and crushed. What does mortified mean? Killed. Internally, he's been killed. How so? Okay, bear in mind, the sash was supposed to keep him alive. How's he internally been killed? He's been proved false. Right? You know, what does Christ tell his followers? If you want to follow me, you got to do what? Louder? Take up your cross daily, and he who would lose his life for my sake will find him. You got to die, in other words. You got to die to this world to live for the other world, etc. Sir Gowan didn't do that. Okay, and that's going to get connected in a moment. So now he's mortified. Notice, he wouldn't die the real death, so now he's got to die kind of a Spiritual death. All the blood in his body burned in his face. I mean, he's just blushing like you cannot imagine. He's turned beet red. So that he winced with shame at what the man said. A curse upon cowardice and covetousness. Cowardice. Where does cowardice come from? Outside? No, it's what's inside. And covetousness. What's covetousness? Exactly. Wanting what somebody else has. He wanted what she had. Once she explained what it was. Okay. You, cowardiceness and covetousness, breed boorishness and vice that ruin virtue. Hmm. Unties the thing and throws it at him. I don't want this no damn belt. There it is, the false thing. May the devil take it. Okay, how can the sash green belt be false? It's like saying, here, take the false thing. It's a marker. There's nothing false or true about it. It's just what it is. So why does he say that? Well, a psychologist would say he's doing what? He's projecting. <laughs> he's projecting his falseness onto this thing. Why? Because then I can get it away from him. He's scapegoating it. Okay? Scapegoating, go back to the book of Exodus. Read the actual law that reveals to, re, that refers to put all the sin on the goat Drive it out of camp and slaughter it out there. Okay? 
removes all one's guilt with such. And notice, may the devil take it. He throws it to the night. For fear of your blow taught me cowardice. Your blow, the night's blow, taught me. Fear taught in cowardice. True or false? I mean, I think Sir Galloway is speaking truly. That is, he's saying what he truly believes. Question is, is what he truly believes true? Or does he believe something that's false? I think he believes something that's false. And what's false in it is the verb choice. The fear of his blow doesn't teach cowardice. It reveals cowardice. Because Sir Gowan is saying there, if I hadn't feared your blow, I would never have any cowardice in me. And that's the problem. What does he want? He wants to live. His cowardice is not being willing to face death. Or the possibility of death. Fear of your blow taught me cowardice. To give way to covetousness. Be false to my... My what? My nature. What does he mean by my nature? Nature here means his birth. It means who, who he really is. This is another false belief. What does Sir Gowan think about himself? Bingo. He thinks, he believes his press clippings. He believes what the poet tells us about Sir Gowan. You know, the pentangle, the five, the perfect five fives. I'm so good. He believes that about himself. Okay? To be false to my nature, the generosity, and okay, now he's explaining what's meant by that word nature. The generosity and fidelity expected of knights. But generosity and fidelity are what? Those aren't nature. Those are virtues. How do you get virtues? Notice the verb, get. You practice them. Read Hamlet. You know, Hamlet when he talks to his mother in her room in Act 3. I believe it is, end of Act 3. He goes to a room, and you know he sees the ghost and everything, and he persuades his mother that her living with her current husband, who is his uncle, is wrong. It's incestuous. Okay? And he says, Mother, assume virtue. That is, pretend to be virtuous. And tonight, don't go to my uncle's bed. And it'll make it easier to not go tomorrow night. And don't go tomorrow night, and it'll make it easier not to go the next night. And he says, and thus, by assuming virtue, you put on virtue. You become virtuous. Practical, real-world example. Smoking. What does it take? You stop with the first cigarette, cigar, whatever it is. It starts with the first drink you don't take. It starts with the first, whatever the vice is, you stop doing it. Yeah, it's hard, but, okay. So, he says, now I am false and unworthy and have always dreaded treachery and deceit. May misfortune and grief befall both. May misfortune and grief befall treachery and deceit, he said. Sir, I humbly confess my good name is marred. What a pompous, arrogant ass Sir Gowan is for saying that. Notice, 
He's confessing that to the Green Knight. Where? At the Green Chapel. It's like the Green Knight is the Green Priest, so to speak. What apparently, go back for a moment, could he not have confessed the previous day? Remember, he meets, the, he meets the lady. She comes in. She mentions what this green belt does. She gives it to him. And what are we told? He immediately does. Goes to Mass that morning. He says confession. He receives absolution. Here's a problem. What can you not confess? Anybody know? Can't confess a sin you haven't done yet, but that you're planning to do. A man can't look at a beautiful woman and go, ah, I'm going to rape her. I better go talk to the priest first and get absolution for what I'm going to do. Why? Because you have to be penitent. You have to be contrite. You can't be contrite for something that you're still planning on doing. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. This is going to become an important idea when we get up to the Renaissance and the whole Protestant Reformation. Okay? So, he apparently... I think it's safe to assume, did not confess to the priest that, oh yeah, by the way, I've got this um, agreement with the knight of the castle that I'm going to give to him whatever I get during the day, and his wife just gave me this sash that will make me invincible to death, and I'm not going to give it to him. Because that's a sin. <laughs> By not agreeing to fulfill the terms of the agreement. I humbly confess my good name is Mark. Let me regain your trust. Next time, I'll be on guard. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Give me another chance. He said what? Three. Third time what? The knight said, third throw. All, it all rides on this. You fail me this time. And the green knight does what? He just laughs. And says, the wrong you did me, I consider white. Out. It's gone. It's done. Don't worry about it. In other words, absolved. <laughs> I've forgiven you. You have so cleanly confessed yourself. Okay, notice that the language. You've confessed. I've absolved you. Admitted your fault. And done honest penance on the edge of my blade. That is, you Bled for it. I declare you absolved of that defense, of that offense, and washed as clean as if you had never transgressed since the day you were born. See, that's what, in the Catholic and Orthodox Christian traditions, that's what confession does. You walk away from the priest after the priest says the prayer of absolution, you are clean as the day you were born. There's a little bit of difference between the Orthodox and the Catholic Western tradition. Because, I shouldn't go into this, but I will. The Orthodox tradition does not believe in what's called original sin. Okay? That's a Western notion. Western comes from St. Augustine. Okay? Bishop of Hippo, the guy, Hippo, the guy who wrote the Confessions and the City of God and such. With Augustine's understanding of original sin, when Adam and Eve sinned and then had children, they passed that sin on to their children. That is, <clears throat> they passed guilt on to their children. The Orthodox don't believe that. What the Orthodox say is what passed on is the results of sin. Death, disease, illness. The Orthodox think of sin as disease. And therefore, Christ is what? As he himself says, the great physician. The church is a hospital. It's where you go to get cured of sin. Okay? So he says, the knight says, you're as if you'd never sinned. And I make you a gift, sir, of my... Now, here, keep the belt. You take it. Since it is green like my gown, Sir Gallon, you may remember this meeting in the world. Notice he's making a distinction between where they are and being in the world. It's almost like 
They're off where? At a monastery, at this green chapel that is separate from the world. So now I'm going to send you back into the world where you mingle with princes of rank. It will be a true token of the exploit of the green chapel among Shavar's knights. In other words, and this will be a, what's meant by token? Louder? Yeah, it's a sign. It'll be a symbol. What did the, the rude say about itself? It called itself a beacon. The actual word that's used in the Old English is the word that we get, from which we get token. It is a token. T-A-C-E-N. Okay? And then it says, and I am the most wondrous sign that can lead people, you know, so he says, back in the world, you're going to be around princes and people of rank. And this will be a sign to them. A visual reminder of what? It's what I think every president, you know, ought to be reminded of daily. Or every politician. You too are susceptible to, you know, this kind of failure. Okay? He says, come on, and you're going to come back to my, my castle at New Year, right? We'll, set out, we'll see out the revelry of this high feast. He says, and I will reconcile you with my wife, who was your cunning foe. The third day, what did they hunt? The fox. The fox. Sir Gallon, no indeed. Uh-uh, ain't going back. I've stayed long enough. Good fortune attend you. And may he who gives all honors soon send you reward. Okay, that's a nice euphemistic, like if it were a funeral, it'd be a great eulogy. What's he saying? May God reward you. May he who sends all honors, every good and perfect gift, St. James says, is from the Father of life, Father of lights. And commend me to that gracious one, your lovely lovely wife, both the one and the other of those honorable ladies. That is, when you go back to your castle, commend me, say good words about me to your wife, on to the other one too, who have so cleverly deluded their night with their game. Say, got me. Deluded. What's it mean to be deluded? Lude is related to looks light. It's to be deprived of the proper light, to not see correctly. They made me see something funny. But it's no wonder if a fool acts insanely and is brought to grief, and what does he do? What is, you know, I'll say this for the male sex. What do we often tend to do when we get involved in an argument with our lovers, female lovers, I'm assuming? We open that mouth so wide, both the, you know, just. What does he say? Who does he blame? Women. Women. It's not his fault. So was Adam beguiled by one here on earth. It's your damn wife's fault. Solomon by several. Samson, another. David was deluded by Bathsheba. Okay, okay. Let's stop here for a moment. Adam and Eve, according to the biblical story, yeah, Eve kind of tricked Adam. Kind of, okay? Okay. Samson by, yeah, definitely Samson was tricked by Delilah. Solomon, eh, what it was, 700 concubines, 300 wives. Solomon was just plain stupid. I mean, one's bad enough, hard enough, let me say that. Hard enough, I mean, not bad enough, okay? Uh, David and Bathsheba. What's that story? He wanted her, yeah. What was she doing? She was married. 
she was taking a bath on the roof of her house. And apparently, this was standard custom at the time. Had a pool of some kind on the roof. And David's over here in his big old palace, and he's doing what? Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Spying on her and says she's a knockout. Okay? Is she doing is she sitting in the airplane in the water going, Ooh, let's weave a spell and David dies and I will be cool? No, she's just going about her business. Okay? What does he do? He sends for her, he sleeps with her, he gets her pregnant, he sends her husband, he's a captain of his army, his most trusted warrior, to the front for what specific purpose? And we're told this in first or second Kings. Uh -uh. That is all on David. Bathsheba is innocent. Okay? Because I don't think she had much choice in whether to sleep with him or not. Oh, yeah. Yep. Big, big Veggie Tales fans. So, beguiled were they all by women they thought kind. Now, Kind there doesn't mean, and they use kind, um, well, that's interesting, because the Middle English does not use the word kind at all, or anything even related to it. 2425, and all of them were bewildered. With women that they used. With the women that they used. Where your translator, James Winnie, has by women they thought kind. Right? Kind. Has multiple means. What is one of the means today? Nice. Okay. What's another one? What kind? It's an Apple, right? It's not a Samsung. It's not a picture on their phone. Which means then what? It, what nature of phone? What variety? Type. The real original meaning for this is its nature. What it is at its origin. Okay? Which, I, which is why I find that translation very interesting. By women, they thought kind or natural, like human ought to be. Since I too have been tricked, then I should pardon the body. What has he just done? Or attempted to do? Let me put it that way. He's attempting to justify the ways of. Gallon to God. You know, Milton writes in Paradise Lost that he's trying to justify the ways of God to man. Why is the world the way it is? Well, I'm going to explain why God is justified for everything that happened. So Gallon is doing, he's absolving himself. Oh, I'm not to blame. It was the woman. Who said that? Adam said that. And what did God say? Damn it, Adam. Damn you, Adam. If Adam had done what? According to traditional Christian theology, if Adam had said, my fault, the fall would have been erased. If he had just said, my fault, but the woman you gave me, and what does Eve do? Yeah, my, nope. The snake. In other words, here's a buck. Pass it on. <laughs> they each pass the buck. So, but for your guilt, but for your belt, God repay you for that. Yeah, I'll keep the belt. So, the knight has absolved him. He, quote unquote, truly confessed. And yet, in doing this, <laughs> it's like the confession is taken back. But I'll take the belt. Not for its gold, not for the girdle itself, nor its sick, uh, nor its silk, nor its long pendants. It's got like fringe on the end of it, you know. No. 
but I shall look at it often as a sign of my failing. And when I ride in triumph, Recall with remorse the corruption and frailty of the perverse flesh, how quick it is to pick up blotches of sin. Pick up. Well, you know, I'm not saying anything about what happened. Okay? I'm just using this as an example. If you heard anything about what happened at the end of last week at a movie street, at a movie set in New Mexico, okay? Um, Yeah, the cinematographer shot by um, Baldwin, not Adam Baldwin, Alec. Alec Baldwin, by Alec Baldwin, okay? If you read the immediate news reports, what did almost every one of them say? A gun misfired, or a gun fired a projectile. Now, every one of those is attempting to do what? Not ascribe blame, right? See, guns don't just misfire up you. If I were to set a gun here, and we were to sit there and watch it, it wouldn't just boom on its own. What has to happen? Uh, fingers got to be put on the trigger, trigger's got to be pulled, or possibly the gun could be cocked and it could be not, okay, and can fire, but somebody's got to shoot it, somebody's got to load it. I read one day, it was the most amazing attempt at passive voice. It was like, you know, It was like, you know, the gun, the gun, you know, fired its own projectile and hit. It's like, Alec Baldwin wasn't even in the room, right? Pick up blotches of sin? No. You don't just, you know, walk along and blotches of sin, you know, jump onto you. What? They come from within, right? So, when pride in my knightly valor stirs me, where does pride come from? It doesn't come from outside. It comes from inside. A glance at this girdle will humble my heart. Just one thing I would ask if it would not offend you. Um, what's your name, real name? Who are you? Back up before I go any farther. What again is on the inside of Sir Gallant's shield? The image of Mary. Why? What is Mary the image of for the church? Remember, this is before any kind of Protestant church. So Catholic Orthodox Church. Primarily, you know, let's say Catholic. She's the image of what? Purity. True faith. Gabriel comes to her and what does she say? Hell no. I'm not going to have that baby. I'm not even married yet. No. Be it to me according to your word. And then she offers, you know, the Magnificat, etc. In other words, she's the sign, symbol of total loyalty. Total faith. The pentangle on the outside? That's another embodiment, another way of, of picturing Mary. Compassion for others? Yeah. She takes God into herself, you know, to birth him into the world, the whole nine yards. Okay, so now, back to you. He says, oh, yeah, my name, Bertilek of Hout Desert. That's what I'm called around here. Through the power of Morgan Le Fay, who lives under my roof, roof and her skill in learning, was I turned over again. She go, he goes on and says, Her skill in learning will taught in magic arts, for she has acquitted many of Merlin's occult powers, for she had loved dealings at an earlier time with that accomplished scholar. In other words, they were lovers. As all your knights know it, all, Morgan the goddess, therefore is her name. No one, however haughty or proud, she cannot tame. She sent me in this shape to your splendid hall to make trial of your pride. To make trial, to test the pride 
of the Knights of the Round Table, and to judge the truth of the great reputation attached to our Christian. And if you know anything about Morgan Le Fay, it wasn't, you know, entirely benign. She wanted to test them and prove them for what? To show their falsehood. She sent me to drive you demented. What does demented mean? Out of your mind. Like in the rolling books, dementor <laughs> means to be to, have, to lose your sanity, right? With this marvel. And to have terrified Guinevere and caused her to die with horror at that figure who spoke like a specter with his head in his hand before the eyes of all. She wanted Guinevere to die of a heart attack. Why? What relation is Morgan to Gawain? Um, that she, that is she who is in my castle, the very old lady, that is the one, you know, the human sharpe, short and squat, broad, bulging box and the whole nine yards, who is actually your aunt, Arthur's half-sister. And Arthur's lover. Because it's from Morgan, if I remember correctly, could be confusing this. It's from Morgan that Mordred, Arthur's son, is born. Who's the cause for Arthur's death? Is his incestuous son, right? <clears throat> yeah, in fact, it says right there, after 2466. Afterwards, Arthur. Uh, the Duchess of Tintagel's daughter, whom noble Uther, afterwards begot Arthur upon, who now is king. So I entreat you, good sir, to visit your aunt, make merry my Come on, come say hello to your aunt. He's like, you do. Give me a cross, somebody. So, Sir Gowan makes his way back home. In 2492, the king kisses the knight, the queen too. The knights come and embrace him. They describe everything that happens. 2496. What happened at the chapel, the Green Knight's behavior, the lady's wooing, and finally the belt. He showed them the scar on his bare neck that he received for his dishonesty at the Lord's hands in rebuke. Tormented by his tail, he groaned for grief and hurt. The blood burned in his face, that is again, red as a beet, when he showed the shameful cut. He holds up the girdle and he says to Arthur, this belt caused the scar that I bear on my neck. Did it? I mean, yes, in a sense. He got the scar because he didn't turn over the belt. But what's the real reason for the scar? He was false inside. This is the injury and damage that I have suffered for the cowardice and covetousness that seized me there. This is the token of the dishonesty I was caught committing. And now I must wear it as long as I live. For a man may hide his misdeed, but never erase it. Okay? And this, I think, is the poet kind of getting to the main meat of what he wants people to learn. You can hide your sin if you want. Okay? You can't erase it. Why not? Traditional Christian theology. Only someone perfect can. You've got to have Jesus, right? But can never erase it, for where once it takes root, the stain can never be lifted. In other words, I am now being a devout, doctrinally pure Christian. I wasn't pure from my birth, he seems to be suggesting. The king consoles the knight, the whole court, notice, they laugh about it. It's like, you know, he's just bared his soul to them, and they laugh at him, like they don't take it seriously. 
But we're told each member of the brotherhood should wear such a belt. A baldric of bright green crosswise, so I think it is right shoulder to left hip on the body, similar to Sir Gawain's, and worn for his sake, and that became part of the renown of the round table. And whoever afterward the word always honored as it set down in the most reputable books of romance. So in the time of Arthur, this adventure happened, the Chronicle of Britain, bear witness to it, blah, 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 blah. 25-25. When the siege and the assault, after brave Brutus came here, when the siege and the assault were ended at Troy, indeed, many exploits before now have happened much like this. Now may the thorn-crowned God, that's Jesus, bring us to his bliss. Notice the thorns apply what? Blood, pain, suffering. Okay. Oni swa ki mal pense. Oni swa ki mal pense. Evil be to him who evil thinks. Evil come to him who evil. If you think evil, guess what? You're going to get evil. And you got a little footnote. Okay. The motto was embroidered on the blue velvet garter worn by knights of the garter, highest order of English knighthood bestowed by the sovereign. It still happens, by the way, every year. Queen Elizabeth, every year, still awards the garter to certain individuals at what are called the commemorations, which are, excuse me, the honors, when she announces the honors in spring, right? According to Frasoir, this is John Frasoir, who wrote the Chronicles of uh, the Hundred Years' War, the order was instituted about 1344. Okay? The poem, we're not sure when it dates from, but it dates from roughly 1350 to 1375. It's part of, if you watch the one lecture, it's part of the alliterative revival. This attempt to revive the alliterative tradition from the old English period, but they didn't know the rules. So, for example, another poet wrote during their literature revival, Plow, Pierce Plowman, excuse me, Langman, who wrote Pierce Plowman, he has a line in his poem. Has a line that reads, A fair field full of folk found I there. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? Where you have five alliterative stresses in the line. Old English, you had four stresses, only three of them could alliterate. I mean, Chaucer's going to make fun of this kind of alliterative pattern in Canterbury Tales. Okay, so done with Sir Gowan. Let's talk about Chaucer for a little bit. Um, well, let me do this. <clears throat> trying to decide if I should talk about the general prologue or... For the purposes of the quiz that we'll have on Chaucer, purposes of the quiz or exam, okay? Here are the pilgrims I want you to be familiar with in terms of the descriptions, all right? The, the, the descriptions are all given in the general introduction. Or the general prologue. And I'm just going to do these in the order that they appear. It's not going to be all of them. So you have the knight, the squire, the nun or nun's prior, as she's also called, the monk, the friar, the clerk of Oxford, Life of Bath, the parson, and his brother, the plowman, the miller, the sumner, and the partner. Just be familiar with those descriptions, all right? Um, now, Chaucer is writing about the same time as Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Okay, a little bit later, I mean, he starts his writing in 
the 1360s, 1370s, but he's probably not writing Canterbury Tales till very late 1380s. Um, Canterbury Tales is taken to be his, you know, his magnum opus, so to speak. Survives in a bunch of manuscripts. There's like 85 manuscripts of Canterbury Tales. Um, I think that's complete. That is all of the Canterbury Tales. And then there's a bunch of other partial fragments. The interesting thing about the Canterbury Tales is you've got several different arrangements of the tales. They don't, they don't all follow the same order. Um, so we're not exactly sure what order Chaucer wanted us to read them in. So that you have in your, I think your introduction talked about this, you have groupings of tales. Now, within those groupings, they're usually the same, right? But it's how those groupings get arranged, right? Um, one, of the, one of the best manuscripts, it's one of the two that is usually chosen to print from, that is to, to give an edition of the Canterbury Tales. It's called the Ellesmere Manuscript, and it's actually in California. Your introduction talks about this. The other one is a Welsh one, it's called the Hayward, and it's in Wales, right? Again, we don't know what order Chaucer wanted these to be arranged. My Chaucer professor, when I was a doctoral student, uh, who's a very famous Chaucer scholar, he was a, a student of one of the you know, trinity of Chaucer scholars. Um, Charles Mormon was my professor. He was a student of George Lyman Kittredge, who was a scholar in the 30s and such. Mormon argued that the Canterbury Tales is complete. Most scholars say the Canterbury Tales is incomplete. Why? Well, Chaucer tells us at the beginning of the poem, the entire poem, it's at the end of the general prologue, that he's going to tell 120 tales. How do we know? Because we have 29 pilgrims plus Chaucer. Right? He's going to say at the beginning of it, line 24. So he's at the Tabard Inn, Chaucer. You can go to this area in London today. The Tabard Inn no longer survives, but you can go to the, the, the exact area. He said he was at the Tavern and 29 pilgrims came in. So 29 plus Chaucer is 30, right? And then he goes through and he describes most of the pilgrims. We get to the end of the general prologue, and the host, the Tabard owner, right, comes up with an idea. I'll go to Canterbury with you, and we'll play this kind of game, right? Each of you will tell two tales going and two tales coming, and I will determine who's the best tale teller, right? And whoever I say determines is the best tale teller, that person's expenses will be paid by the rest of us. And you have to agree to this right now. Everybody has to agree. And everybody goes, cool. We're in. We're, in. we're down for this. Okay? So 30 times 4, 120 tails. Why? Why 120? Well, because the French, excuse me, the Italian poet, Boccaccio, wrote prior to this is Decameron, a hundred tales. This is during the plague, okay? It's a bunch of knights and ladies leave the town, go off to a villa, and they're going to spend ten nights, and over that ten nights, ten tales will be told every night. A hundred tales. So what Chaucer's trying to do, he's going to see your hundred tails, and I'll raise you twenty tails. Okay. 
So the framework is, you know, each person will tell four tales. That's the framework upon which, upon which it's built upon. The only problem is, Chaucer doesn't even get anywhere. He doesn't even get 30 tales out of this. So almost all scholars say it's incomplete. He didn't finish it. Morbin argued he did finish it. Because midway through the poem, the entire poem, look, we have the host say, well, now that we're half done with our tale telling. In other words, the host is changing the terms of the agreement. And when we get to the last tale, the host says, inter, kind of introduces it and says, now we have one tale to go. And I think it's, I don't remember. Number is 23, 24 tales total. So it goes from 120 down to 12 down to whatever the final number is. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. And yeah, we'll do the general prologue. We'll probably do as much of it as we can. And then we'll try to do the wife of Bath's tale in one day.